have the amount for all activity and occur only of course. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Can you hear me all okay? Yeah. Super, great. So basically, you've already heard a lot this morning about numerical relativity simulations we've done on the last few pair of codes, run from run, runs. My point will be that ain't necessarily so. It is a little example. Actually, I'm called and it's right here on my laptop. Um, actually, let's submit the job. We'll do that right now. And I will ignore it for the rest of the talk. We will just come back to that at the end of this. Okay, so in the meantime, let's, um, let's go to the So I'm going to tell you about curvy linear coordinates. And actually, one thing that maybe I should clarify before we get started is we use actually coordinates in two different senses. Sometimes we talk about coordinates when we make a choice between, let's say, maximum slicing, one plus log slicing, shift collisions, and whatnot. Really, that kind of determines the geometry of the coordinates. What I'll be talking about, or what I mean here, is really the topology of coordinates. So for example, Cartesian coordinates go E from minus infinity to plus infinity. So your component coordinates have a radial coordinates go from zero to infinity, and then the theta goes from pole to pole, and five and goes round to the So that's what I'm interested in. And um, so basically, my point will be that essentially there's more to life than Cartesian coordinates. All right. So basically, many codes use Cartesian coordinates. They're wonderful for many different reasons. They have many great applications, but they also have some downsides. So you've heard uh, this morning already about AMR. Actually, I stole this picture from Zach. I think that's a previous iteration from the one that you used this morning. Okay, but basically the idea is to use AMR to basically resolve these various different length scales. But if you think about this carefully, you will see that <coughs> this leads to really an inefficient allocation of grid points. Think, for example, about waves that, that are emitted from the binary. Really, the angular resolution of those waves of the angular intersides remains the same, yet in Cartesian grid coordinates, you will have to refine basically all three coordinates. So that is inefficient. Moreover, you often encounter uh, numerical artifacts as the, at these AMR uh, interfaces. So there's, there's downsides to Cartesian coordinates. Now, why might one consider curvy linear coordinates? For example, spherical polar coordinates? Well, because in many cases, systems are more spherical than Cartesian. For example, this image of a supernova looks more like a sphere to me than a cube. Okay? So it may, the, there are applications in which basically you can use, make use of approximate or exact symmetries by using appropriate coordinate systems. So examples are um, basically applications where there's just one center, gravitation collapse, supernova accretion, whatnot. Okay? So in this case, you can actually allocate the grid points efficiently. Usually there's no need for AML at all, so you don't deal with those issues at all. Okay, there's also applications where really you're interested in deviations from an exact spherical symmetry, for example, in the context of critical collapse. In Cartesian coordinates, you always have deviations from spherical symmetry, just because of the numerical error that is being dependent. Whereas in spherical <coughs> coordinates, you can do it very beautifully. Okay? Also, there are many community codes, or codes in the astrophysical community, that use spherical polar coordinates, that use a very, uh, that use a very uh, sophisticated treatment of the microphysics. And basically, in essence, we would like to combine that you know, sophisticated treatment of the microphysics with a sophistic treatment, sophisticated treatment of gravity, and that involves basically providing methods that uh, work in spherical coordinates. Now there are other situations when more general curvy linear coordinates might be appropriate, like for example cylindrical coordinates. For the binary problem, one might use some like kind of bispherical coordinates. So there's, there's lots of different possibilities. Now having said that, there are of course also real disadvantages. One disadvantage is the Coulomb factor. So basically the Coulomb factor links the size of the time step to the size of the smallest physical scale in the grid cell as coordinate lines converge towards the center of the spherical polar coordinates, for example, that landscape becomes smaller and smaller. That, of course, is a problem, and therefore, basically, this um, the, the, uh, imposes a severe limit on the time step. Okay? Now, the good news is, this problem is not new in this context, that it exists in any code that can use spherical polar coordinates, like the Hamilton hydrogen. You can use any technique that has been developed in that context to to uh, mitigate these issues here. Th those techniques do, for example, the forcing of the grids, the so-called yin, uh, yin yang grids, which have been introduced in the concept of geophysics. Okay? There's frequency filtering. Joseph, Joseph is working on that. Zach is on the different, working on a different method. So there's certainly things that you can do. Okay? 
In the meantime, what, everything that I'll show you is, uses a technique that's called brute force. Okay, I'll just allow for very small time steps, and I can afford <coughs> that because I use so few special brute um, The other issue, of course, is the appearance of coordinate singularities. And anybody familiar with the history of numerical relativity realizes that dealing with singularities can be very painful. Okay, they could go out, so why allow for more singularities? But basically, it turns out we can work around that in, in what I think is a very elegant way. Okay, so uh, here's an example. This is the wave equation of spherical polar coordinates, which we can write in first order in time form in this way. If we now write this Laplace operator in terms of the spherical polar coordinates, you see you get all these terms that uh, diverge at the origin and on the axis. Okay? Now clearly, if you use a code that has grid points on the axis or at the origin, then basically you're done. Okay? So let's not do that. So what I'll use is a self-centered grid, so there's never a grid point at the origin or on the axis. And then it turns out you can actually integrate this, even though there are similar terms on the right-hand side. Okay? Not every evolution scheme allows you to do that. Actually, if you heard me talk about this a few years ago, you heard me explain the so-called PERC method, and partially implicit runner color method, which was developed by Pedro Montero, and he's about Cabrera Carillon, and uh, we use that, that works well. In the meantime, we learned, actually, you could also use method lines with a higher order method, for example, four quarter and runner color, and that works perfectly fine, too. So you can integrate these equations, even though they're similar terms of the right hand sides, as long as, and that's kind of the take of the message, as long as those terms are treated analytically. So the game plan then is, let's implement numerical relativity and curvilinear coordinates in the presence of these singular terms. And maybe I should back up, of course, you realize there have been many codes that use spherical polar coordinates in GR, starting with the first codes in the 60s. <coughs> but those, those codes in general basically use a technique that is of the regularization. So basically, <coughs> you take the, um, the equations and then you make modifications to eliminate the singular terms. Okay? That works in spherical symmetry. It also works in, uh, uh, in axis symmetry. I did that with quite much. Evans, for example, did those simulations. But I'm not aware of anybody having done this without any symmetry assumption because it gets very, very messy. Okay? The beauty of this approach is that we will not regularize these there will be similar terms on the right hand side, but we'll treat them analytically. And that, that is the key. Okay, so um, the, uh, the idea is that we all treat all of those analytically. And I use two ingredients in order to do that. One is a reference metric formulation. I'll explain what that is. Okay. I, I've implemented this for ESSN, also for Z for C, so that work, it works the same way. And also, you need a rescaling of the tensorial point. Now, again, they think most of my talk will be explaining what that means. So, what do I mean by a reference metric formulation? Okay, so, um, I'm going to do this an example of VSSN, which is kind of dear to my heart. Okay. Maybe you've encountered VSSN before. Okay. So, basically, maybe you know that you start doing that by writing the spatial metric, gamma ij, in decomposed a conformally. So, there's a conformal factor of psi to the fourth, times a conformally related metric. And then if you're used to a Cartesian version of ESSN, then <coughs> you assume that the determinant of this conformal related metric is 1. Okay. Now that, on the one hand, uniquely determines the conformal factor, otherwise that is not going to be uniquely determined. Okay. But also it has a neat effect that it simplifies the calculation for what we call the conformal connection function. So that's the other key ingredient in the ESSN formulation. You have these conformal connection functions, which are really the traits of the Christoffel symbols, and then you may remember one of these identities from problem 7.7 7 in the problem book, and then you that this trace is the same as this expression of the derivatives. And now you notice, oh, if this gamma bar is 1, then beautifully these two terms are just 1, so this is just basically partial divergence of the metric that is beautiful, and that, that, that simplifies things dramatically. Okay. Now, if you think a little bit more about this, now you realize that if we're not in Cartesian coordinates, let's say we're in spherical polar coordinates, then gamma equals 1. Gamma bar equals 1 is not a suitable choice. Okay? Because, for example, the flat metric in spherical polar coordinates is 1 r squared r squared sine theta. So they determine this r, r to the 4 sine squared theta. That is different from 1. Okay? So that seems unnatural. Now we could say, OK, fine. Maybe I'll make a different choice for gamma bar. Maybe I choose it to be r to the 4 sine squared theta. But actually, there's a more elegant way of dealing with this. 
And that is this reference metric approach, which was developed by these folks here, Monzola and Eric Bouillon and David Brown. Okay. The idea is that you actually really what you only need is a, a, a reference connection. And yet it is actually easier to think about this by not just assuming a reference connection, but a reference metric. So I will introduce a new metric. This is not a biometric theory, it's, I'm not talking about a different theory of gravity, it is just plain GR, I'm just writing it in this, in this way. Okay? So we introduce a reference metric, and I will always choose this reference metric to be the metric in the same coordinate system, the flat metric in the same coordinate system. So when I use spherical polar coordinate systems, if it's spherical polar coordinates, then this reference metric will be the, the flat metric expressed in spherical polar coordinates. Then you can, from this, you can compute the associated connection, <coughs> It's for performance, this would be things like R, 1 over R, cotangent theta, things like that. Okay? And then what we'll do is we'll define this difference between two connections. One is the connection that is associated with the conformally related metric, and the other one is this connection associated with the reference metric. Okay? Now let's observe a couple of things about these delta gammas. Okay? For stars, notice that in Cartesian coordinates, the delta gammas are exactly the same as the gamma bars. Why is that? Well, because in Cartesian coordinates, the flat metric is just one one one. That means the, co the reference connection is zero. These terms disappear, and we have that within them. Now, here's something else. This is something that you may or may not remember from your GR course. Okay? What you maybe learned is that while Christoffel symbols do not transform as tensors, the difference between two Christoffel symbols does transform as a tensor. I never knew what that was good for okay, until I started working with it. <laughs> it's very good. Okay, so now, these things actually transform as tensors. That's kind of neat. Okay. One consequence of that is that if we're actually dealing with flat space, then these deltas will be zero in all coordinate systems. Why? Because they will be zero in Cartesian coordinates. They transform as tensors. Voila. Okay, that's beautiful. All right? So even though the gamma hat, of course, they will be really singular. Okay? Uh, now, you could ask, wait, wh what is this good for? Because if I'm in curvilinear coordinates, both of these terms will be singular. So why would I want to take a difference between two singular terms? In what way would that pop how could that possibly help? And the answer is, is that's not how you compute these deltas. How you, you, you compute them instead from this expression down here. Okay? So where the deltas are given by Basically, it looks like a Christoffel symbol, except now we're using the covariant derivative, albeit the covariant derivative with respect to the reference metric. Okay? Now, we could prove this by actually writing out the terms and just checking it kind of in a <coughs> pedestrian way, but it's also a nice, much nicer way, the non pedestrian, maybe, I don't know, you but I don't know, whatever. Okay? Um, notice that this is a tensorial expression, unlike the equation for Christoffel symbols. The left-hand side is a tensor, as we just observed. The right-hand side is a tensor because it's a covariant derivative. To prove a tensorial equation, I just need to pr prove it to you in one particular coordinate system. Let's do it in Cartesian coordinates. In Cartesian coordinates, we just observed that these are the same as just the gamma bars. In Cartesian coordinates, also the covariant derivatives with respect to the flat just become partial derivatives. And you see you get exactly the equation that you're used to for, for these crystals. Okay, so, so that in, in fact, this kind of type of proof carries through to other geometrical objects. For example, we will need to figure out what is the Ricci tensor in this formalism. It carries through in exactly the same way. And the rule of thumb is that whenever you compute differences in geometric quantities, you just replace the partials with the covariant derivative with respect to the reference metric. Okay? This technique you can use to derive the ESSN equations in this reference metric formalism. The idea is that it is true that we still have gamma bars, but now we will write them as the sum of these two terms. These terms are already given uh, analytically. They, they are singular, true, but we know them analytically. These terms we will compute from the metric, and I'll actually show you how we do that in, in a minute. We also introduced the traits of these delta gammas. These are now these lambdas, which play the same role as the connection functions in, in, in uh, this is N. Now, uh, uh, so you use this, you can derive this metric formulation. By doing that, you can express all singular terms that appear in the equations analytically. And that brings us halfway to our goal, because we need all terms, all singular terms analytically, not just those that appear in the equations, but also those that appear in the solutions. Okay? And those, in, 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 those are now tensorial fields. 
And remember this, if you have a tensor, if you transform a tensor from the <coughs> to the coordinates of sweep of those coordinates, you will also get singular terms. So those we also need to deal with, and that's why uh, if we, 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 do the, we do this rescaling. So I scale out appropriate powers of R and some theta from all tensorial quantities, and that allows me to do those <coughs> and learn from okay. So here's an example. So let's take spherical coordinates. The reference metric in spherical coordinates is just a flat metric. Here's the flat metric in spherical coordinates. Okay? Now the conformally related metric I write as the flat metric plus some deviation, which is not linear. So I'm not linearizing. It's probably not linear. It's just it's a deviation, okay? which not, need not be small. And this deviation I now write in terms of these functions h, i, j, if you want, but I decorate them with the appropriate powers of r and sine theta that I would get if I transform a regular metric from Cartesian coordinates into spherical coordinates. And in essence, what I'll do in the code, these ages will be my grid functions. Okay, those are the functions that are evolved. Okay? And these I handle analytically. This is how you rescale a, a rank two tensor with indices downstairs, a rank one tensor with indices upstairs will become the opposite, you will do this, and again, there's these ages or these little lambdas are the functions that you actually evolve in the code. Those will remain regular for regular space time. How do you now compute these deltas? Well, you need the covariant derivative of these gammas, covariant derivative with respect to the reference metric. Now, here's a neat identity. Basically, if you compute this, we insert Basic our expression for gamma bar, <coughs> that was a reference metric plus the epsilons. The first term disappears identically because it's covariant derivative of the metric of, with the associated metric. So it's just this term. And these you can now work out in terms of these functions h. Here's the easiest one, here's the hardest one. So there's 18 of those terms. You have to compute them once, but then you have them. And then you can compute all of these terms in each, all of these terms in terms of these functions h, okay? and its derivatives. Okay? Now you notice when h is zero, meaning that epsilon is zero, meaning that we're dealing with a flat metric, all of these terms will be identically zero as advertised. Okay? So there's, you, you now have an exact expression for, for that. Okay? So you don't rely on finite difference in terms that go on with r. Right? And again, basically, the all factors r and some data are treated relatively. You can then implement these equations numerically. I already told you that it would be a good idea to use a self centered grid so that you don't have a good point that r equals zero or sine theta equals zero. Here's an example. Okay? Um, my particular implementation has to use this for the differencing, um, several other features that are not really important. One point that is important is the following. Imagine you have a grid point, let's say right there, neighboring the axis. Okay? Now you take finite differences, and you notice that basically you need the two nearest neighbors that are on the other side of the axis. Okay? Now those points are not part of your grid there. However, you can fill them from other interior points just somewhere else in the grid. So these two points will correspond not to that value of phi, but phi plus pi. Okay? So you, in fact, all these ghost, the so-called interior ghost points, there's some across the axis, there's some across the, the origin. <coughs> you can fill by copying data from somewhere else in the point. You, of course, you have to carefully identify which ones those points are. Okay? There's one trick in that, and that is the unit vectors. Some of the unit vectors change sign as you go across the origin of the axis. For example, at this point, the radial unit vector will point in that direction outwards. Here, the radial po the vector points the unit vector points in the other direction. So, therefore, you need to multiply certain tensor components with a minus one. So there's basically you have to worry about the parity, and that's why I sometimes like calling these boundary conditions paired boundary conditions. And then the out only outer, true physically outer to the point are the ones out here. And I use the sum of L boundary condition or the bound boundary condition to do whatever you would like to do. And actually in many ways this is easier than Cartesian coordinates because actually the boundary is perpendicular to the direction of polygon waves so that actually many things work very nicely. It's very We've performed many tests. Okay, I'll just walk you through a, a few of them very quickly. This is basically the first test that we did back um, uh, you know, about five or six years ago when we first implemented this. This is actually a non axisymmetric linear wave, the Tarkovsky wave. I, I believe that this is actually the first 
genuine three D simulations, uh, simulation in numerical relativity with spherical coordinates. You see this beautiful agreement between analytical solution and the numerical solution. So all of that was very beautiful. Here's a you can check you know the, the black holes. Uh, these, these are just short of black holes for now. If you can do this. You, we can set this up in different ways. We could start with black holes uh, represented in wormhole. Ge uh, Wormhole geometry that evolved this with a one plus one slicing condition, and you will see the geometry settle down to a trumpet geometry. Or we could start with the analytical expressions for trumpet geometry and then check that actually any time the evolution converges away at the expected rate as you evolve this. So there's different ways of doing that. Now there's one common misperception, and that is that when you use spherical photocoordinates and spherical photocoordinates, that you're assuming something about the symmetry about the center. And that is actually not true at all. I mean, take your favorite space time, pick your favorite point, spatial point in that space time, choose that favorite point as the origin of the spherical polar coordinates. This is performing coordinates transformation. You know, there's no need for symmetry at all. Clearly, you can do this, right? That also means that there's no need for this black hole to be centered on the origin. You <laughs> could pull it away from the origin, as for example, in this image, right? So there's, there's the origin, okay, at, uh, at z equals zero. The, the black hole now is actually on the axis, just about the origin. We can evolve these black holes. This is actually up to t plus 10m. There's both the initial data and the evolved data. And here you can only tell the difference. Okay. Now, mind you, this kind of defeats the purpose of spherical polar coordinates, but it's, it's basically a point of principle <coughs> that no, you do not assume any symmetry. You, you, you can handle that. Okay. Now, in fact, we could also look at that head on collision of two black holes. Okay. Maybe I'll go out of this is a good movie. Uh, many of you have seen this movie already, but it's still an amazing, well, that's an assumption, but anyway. So um, maybe I'll make this a little bit larger. Okay, so maybe I should explain first what you'll see. This is the entire grid with the outer boundary imposed there. First, I'll just zoom <coughs> in, then time will start advancing. These are real initial data for one larger mass, a more massive black hole at minus two, a smaller black hole at plus one. Both of those are basically in wormhole geometries if you want. You will see a transition from wormhole to, wormhole to trumpet uh, geometry and then they will start uh, uh, falling towards each other. Okay, so it, it, now we've zoomed in. You see the transition here. Now you see the transition here later because it's a larger M. You see how this black hole is falling here. It's, well, it falls through the origin. The origin sits there. Now they converge at the center of mass on the other, you know, on the other side of the origin and it settles down and so basically now we're just turning the origin is sitting there, right? So basically the code does it. So basically there's no issue with the black hole falling through the, through the origin. Uh, so this is uh, just one, one test. Um, I think this I have on the black incident. Okay, so these are slides of this okay, but I always show you that. Uh, let me, okay, so let me tell you quickly about one application that, that, um, for which I, I've used this code, that for which it has been very useful, and that is critical collapse. So critical collapse in, or critical phenomena in uh, gravitational collapse were discovered <coughs> in 1993 by Matt Sharptrek. Those of you who paid attention back then, they know exactly what's going on. For those who didn't, sorry you don't have enough time to explain what goes on. Okay, but basically, in, in essence, a, a critical phenomena here at the threshold of black hole formation, the, 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 let, let's say you start with some initial data, you evolve these initial data, there is a parameter, this parameter is small, these initial data will, will be interact but then disperse to infinity. If the parameter is sufficiently large, you will form a black hole. Now you could wonder what happens at the, at the onset on at this critical parameter. Uh, Matt Sharpton originally did this for scalar fields, uh, that triggered this whole everybody um, Literature is all these fascinating phenomena, uh, scaling laws, critical exponents, remarkable similarities with, uh, in, with similar phenomena in other fields of physics, phase transitions, and so forth. Here's just one example. Let's do this for a radiation fluid. By radiation fluid, I mean a fluid for which p equals kappa rho, where kappa is just one third. I choose some initial data, which essentially I so much hope that that's not my point. <laughs> Oh boy, can you just turn it off? I'm so oh, sorry. Yeah. Or oh, tell them that I'm busy right now. <laughs> 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 I'm 
I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> boy, okay. um, so, so we choose initial data with some just like some Gaussian distribution. There's a parameter eta, and again, if eta is that time is up for you. Oh, that's what it means. Okay. Um, basically, we find it, so if eta is small, we get plots. <laughs> you know what? Let's turn this thing off. This <laughs> If at least for something interesting, right? <coughs> uh, if eta is large, then it forms a black hole. Okay? And basically what we'll do is we'll fine tune this eta to just this onset of black hole formation. What you notice is that you get a self-similar critical solution. That means that it is a solution that doesn't change shape, but it just contracts in some similar way. Okay? We can analyze this with a dimensional quantity, which Chuck Evans and Coleman introduced this omega, which is just rho times r squared, right? Rho is used one to one squared, so this is dimensionalism. You throw in back a whole pile of good measure, I suppose. And, and um, let me show you another move. So this is the um, this is this function omega. And basically, this is in the right of the pole, this is in the direction of the equator. You, you do see some time variation, you see a feature emerging, and this feature will, will give rise to this critical solution, okay? And now you notice that you don't notice any change in the shape of the solution for quite a while, because it is contracting, but I'm pulling, I'm, I'm pulling apart the spatial coordinates, it's just the right rate, so that you don't notice any shape in this function. So it's contracting self-similarity, but I'm pulling out the coordinates so that you follow this. And in a minute, we'll lose it because it's a subcritical solution. There it goes. Okay, now, I will, what I want to look at, what happens if we have this aspherical deformation? In this case, it's a pretty large aspherical deformation. Okay, that's this colored surface. Again, again, this is the direction of the pole. This is the direction of the equator. But now, in this self-similar phase, you notice that this aspherical solution kind of oscillates around this spherical solution. And it seems to be matter sloshing back and forth from the pole to the equator and back. Okay? So there's some oscillation going on. And you can already tell that the amplitude of the oscillation appears to be getting smaller. Now we'll watch this one more time. Now I'll include these green dots, which mark the maximum of this function omega, both in the direction of the pole and in the equator. And what, what I'll plot here is the difference between these two maxima. Okay? Once we're in the self symbol between, which is roughly now, and basically, this will be, uh, again, it looks like an oscillation. We notice that the amplitude of the oscillation gets smaller. You also notice that the period of the oscillation gets smaller. And that makes sense because it's still similarly contracting. So the length scale of the solution becomes smaller. So any perturbation of that solution, <coughs> the time scale should also get shorter. Okay? And so that's exactly what you see. Okay? So now this is the plot of delta omega as a function of proper time tau. Uh, I'll show you this plot one more time, and just as a little demonstration of how useful spherical polar coordinates are. You might worry, you notice that I only had 12 grid points. You heard that, 12 grid points, right? And now, but even though there was a large angular dependence, but it's not a very steep angular dependence. It's very, it's, 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 uh, I mean, there's large differences, but you can resolve it very easily with 12 grid points. This is the function that I curve that I showed you. Now I reproduced it three more times with 10, 8, and 6 grid points. And really the only difference is when you have 6 grid points. So this is one of these examples where you can very efficiently make use of this approximate symmetry by using certain polar coordinates. Okay? Now what you notice, again, basically I'll explain to you why the period gets shorter. Once you recognize that, you also notice it's going to be much more natural to actually plot this as a function of a so-called logarithmic time where you stretch this critical time how it starts, it can be traced to the infinity. Then the same function plot in terms of this time looks very much like an exponentially damped cosine or something like that. In fact, it can fit it to an exponentially damped cosine. There it is. You see beautiful agreement. You can read off both the decay time and the oscillation period. And in fact, Carson Lundler computed, predicted from linear perturbations that that's exactly what these solutions should do. In fact, he has even predictions for lambda and omega. Here they are. And here are our numerical results for various different sizes of the initial deviation. So this is a beautiful confirmation of the results. This is, in fact, has some astrophysical 
the ramifications too, because it means that these oscillations are stable, they decay. That means that the scaling laws go to the smaller scales. That is important for the issue of the and the formation of time order black holes. Really, the universe when the universe was dominated by the radiation fluid. That means that those scaling laws apply in that epoch. So, and now there have been more recent application implementations of uh, these methods. The one implementation is, uh, uh, is the one that Zach uh, took the lead on with his, his postdoc and the former RIT student Ian in uh, Rockland. And, uh, basically, it's NERPI uh, and, and CNA. NERPI is basically a Python based interface that produces a C code in various different four decisions that you can choose uh, with, with a, a user specified kind of difference order that's very beautiful. Here's an example for the wave that you would find from the head-on collision of two black holes, and you notice that you can follow this signal over many, many orders of magnitude with a remarkable agreement with the theoretical prediction. So that is really very beautiful. Okay. Um, this code is also publicly available. I'm sure Zach has already told you about this. There's a web page you can look at that. The other implementation, of course, is in the Einstein toolkit, which Basile uh, Medes took the lead on. Uh, this is this implementation. Here's an example for uh, the uh, rotating black hole that basically starts at the bowen York black hole, i.e. conforming flat, and then settles down to a curved black hole. In the process, it also emits a gravitational wave signal. You notice here the blue line is the one with the higher angular resolution spherical line. And you see how, again, you can follow this signal to <coughs> over many orders of magnitude. For comparison purposes, the red line is a Cartesian implementation where you do, you basically are dominated by noise up to just a few magnitudes. So again, these code systems work much better for these purposes. So here's my summary. Um, I told you about implementation of numeric relativity curvy coordinates, the main texts, I told you about application, I told you about recent and public available applications that we can experiment with. But now we're all eager to see what my colleague did, right? So Remember, we started the code, you know, so basically, what did it do? Actually, I should first have to tell you what, do I have a minute, another minute, is that a thing? Uh, that's how, you know, uh, without the phone call, that would be just fine. <laughs> so basically, I'll, I'll make it very quick. Basically, the, the thing that this code is working on is an initial TO, TOD solution. Okay, it's, you remember from the TOD solution, there's a stable branch and an unstable branch. I start with initial data on the unstable branch. If that's a evolve with hydrodynamics, this solution can do one of two things. It can collapse into a black hole, depending on the initial equation, of course, or it could basically move over to the stable branch and perform oscillation around the stable branch, where the corresponding density is about 0.1 or something. So it should move from 0.8 to 0.1. That's in fact what this, like what presumably happened, at least the time, last time I checked. Okay, so if you let's kill this now, bye bye. Okay, um, you know, we can look at uh, graph. Here's, here's a graph of the central density, and it, it goes from 0.8 and then oscillates around 0.1. So this is <coughs> that's what this code just computed. And we can also look at a, a, a quick movie um, of the density. Okay, so this is the density, and you see how this star <coughs> oscillates and has this kind of breathing mode, and of course it will do this for a little while. I mean, this is mildly amusing to watch, but it's much more interesting to actually look at this on a long scale. Um, and that would be the very long scale that I will do. Okay, are we done yet? Yes, now we're done. So that's so the long scale line. And now what you see is um, basically that how the star, actually in the process of these oscillations, actually emits an envelope, and then you'll see it's a session of shock waves going through the envelope as it continues to the wire. Okay, so anyway, that's what this stuff so does. Okay. And again, basically the code just did that part of it in my talk. There was no need for massive repetitive interfaces or the game. So I'll stop here. I'm sorry for taking you.